está con nosotros. Thank you for being here with us today for, for a webinar that is extremely important and, and, uh, and it's uh, really interesting. So it's an honor to support the World Bank and this event. And uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Carlos Felipe Jaramillo, the Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean for his great support and cooperation. To begin with this event that there will be simultaneous interpretation into Spanish, English and Portuguese. Select the language on the bottom of your screen to select the language you would prefer to hear. your preferred uh, language. Uh, we will also have a, a Q&A section at the end of the presentations. So please write your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. También vamos a tener una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. There respuesta. will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. So please feel free to write down your questions in the Q&A functionality uh, in the Zoom page. Then lastly, I would like to let you know that this uh, video is available in Spanish in the YouTube channel of the El Dialogo and it will be available after the event. Dialogue's YouTube channel in Spanish. Creo que todos coincidimos que el año pasado... So I think that we all agree that last year uh, the region had has experienced a very significant crisis in, in modern history. No sector and the society or in the different countries had to go through a backward um, process, uh, for example, like the educational sector uh, experienced. And uh, it will be, in order to succeed, it will be necessary to, to join efforts, innovating efforts in, in 2021 and in subsequent years. The, we have been working for uh, almost 30 years in this area, and there is a platform, an open platform to exchange ideas and perspectives in order to to better organize uh, or arrange these efforts to make sure that they are as sufficient as possible. So I want to express my gratitude as well uh, for the important uh, work that has been done by Ariel Fitchbein, who is directing our program and who has shown great uh, leadership from uh, the inter intellectual uh, perspective by working with his uh, awesome team. And he has developed uh, activities, uh, events, and reports to analyze the situation and to suggest recommendations, realistic recommendations and constructive recommendations. So thank you, Ariel, and to his team. I want to express uh, my gratitude to Carlos Felipe for his trust and his cooperation and the outstanding panelists and specialists that are joining us here today and uh, who will share their knowledge, their standpoints, their perspectives. So I am confident that this will be an extremely fruitful discussion in such an important moment we're experiencing for the well-being of Latin America and the Caribbean. So I will pass the floor now to Felipe Jaramillo. Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you, Ariel. It is a pleasure to be here with you today with uh, inter an Inter-American Dialogue. Please allow me to um, express press or to talk about this report in the context the region or region in Latin America and the Caribbean has uh, been severely affected by the pandemic unfortunately we have been the, the epicenter of, uh, of what has been experienced in the past year despite the fact that the the region 
uh, barely represents 10% of the global population, we have had more than 20% of the cases of this virus and 30%, nearly 30% of the fatalities or at, the, uh, at a global level. We have six of the countries with the highest number of fatalities per million inhabitants. So the impact is not only in terms of health, there has been an impact in the economic area and in the social indicators, which has been strongly affected according to our estimates the GDP of the region fell uh, nearly 7% in the prior year. This is the worst crisis ever in nearly a century um, based on the information that has been reported in this regard. And the, in the impairment of the social indicators, the increase of inequality has uh, led to uh, losing from one to two decades of uh, progress. And unfortunately, I must say, and, and despite the hopes we had uh, in terms of uh, 2021 being a year of fast recovery, unfortunately, the pandemic has not stopped. Although in some countries the COVID cases had decreased, the global trend indicates a second and in some regions a third peak of the pandemic and the uncertainty remains there and the perspectives are really uncertain. Now, talking about education, which is the topic at hand, the subject that we have to address, the impact of the pandemic has been uh, perhaps uh, less visible, but not less dramatic. At the end of February 2021, we calculated that nearly four-fifths or 80% of children in school age in the region, we're talking about 120 million um, had lost or they were at risk of losing a, a whole school year of, of, um, of, of uh, education. So this is why we believe that this is the worst crisis that uh, the system, the education system has faced in the past century in a region. The study that we're presenting today shows the huge consequences of the closing of, uh, of schools uh, on the human capital of boys, girls, and, and adolescents in the region. With uh, the closing of schools uh, that lasted nearly 10 months, they could the students could lose one year of uh, school education, which may translate into losses of uh, human capital and productivity. As a matter of fact, as indicated by the by the uh, by the losses, there may be a very significant uh, loss. Uh, due to the loss of the future revenue of uh, this generation, which is estimated at $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion US dollars. So in other words, that represents 16% uh, of the GDP in the region. After experiencing certain progress with the reopening of schools, Unfortunately, the recent increase in the number of uh, COVID cases has decreased or decelerated this process. Several countries in the region opened their schools after vacations, but many of them were forced to close those schools again to return to um, remote learning due to the recent outbreak of the virus. So in this context, it is important that uh, given the volatility, the high levels of volatility, countries uh, are should be getting ready to reopen their schools in such a way so as to sustain the recovery process, to recover the learning that will be long and difficult. Uh, as soon as uh, schools can reopen. At the same time, the volatility of uh, the pandemics is demanding flux for flexible schemes, at least uh, in the interim period to allow the education systems to adapt 
quickly to the changing uh, context. So it is essential for countries to keep on improving their uh, remote learning and hybrid education. Those where where um, they can combine both types of input in of education. So in this, it is important to to close the technology gaps in the educational systems in the region, paying special attention to, to the gap suffered by the, by the most vulnerable um, groups who are not gaining access to digital money. But allow me to, to finish uh, my intervention in a, with a positive remark. The pandemic also represents an opportunity, a unique opportunity. The countries, uh, have, countries have had that the opportunity to undertake measures and reform to rebuild a more secure, effective, and resilient education systems during the closing and the opening of schools. It's been reconforting to see that new and technology innovations have been presented to face the situation. And some of them, in my opinion, were actually very successful and they should be adopted on a permanent basis to try to improve the learning and the management of these systems. Then finally, the crisis can also represent an opportunity to create more equitable systems, for example, as by reducing the digital gaps to promote a true quality of opportunities within a region. So in this case, the time to benefit from this opportunity is now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felipe, Michael. And uh, I will ask um, uh, Emanuela, who's the manager of uh, education practice uh, in the World Bank for Latin America and the Caribbean, to do a presentation of the report that uh, Felipe Jaramillo was referring to. The report is available in uh, on the web page of the World Bank and also in the page of El Dialogo. So without any further ado, uh, Emanuela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ariel. I don't know if you can hear me. Perfect. I don't know if you can see the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for uh, giving us the opportunity to present uh, the results of the report that the World Bank has just completed on the in terms of the costs and the responses uh, on the of the pandemic in the education sector. My presentation will will ha will cover seven parts. I will do it fast because I know that we have we're short uh, in terms of time. So I will start by uh, reminding where where the education was before the pandemics. Uh, we're going to talk about the the impact that the pandemic had has had on the closing of schools and the efforts that the, that the LAC has done in terms of. Uh, uh, remote learning, and also to recognize that, that despite these efforts, the cost that you, we will see in terms of, of uh, learning will be really significant because remote learning cannot replace the, um, the education at school, face-to-face -face learning. So what is it that we need to do to succeed in this case? Before the pandemic, it, was, it is important to remind that the, that the region was undergoing a, a crisis situation. There are many metrics that you can use. I can talk about one, the poverty in terms of uh, learning. Kids uh, who lack their, their, their capacities to complete their, their school education. It indicated that 51% of children were undergoing this situation. And if we look at, uh, at the 15 year old students, we already noted that before the pandemics, they were uh, three years behind uh, compared to the um, uh, students of the OECD. We also noticed that there were a lot of gaps within each country. So then we 
are hit by the pandemic and as indicated by Felipe in, in, Amer in Latin America, this has been quite dramatic from, from the sanitary and economic standpoint. I do not have to remind you about this anymore. What's true is that the pandemic has led to school closures extensive in Latin America affecting uh, nearly 170 million students and this is the this is the most important men message uh, um, Latin America has been affected uh, strongly by the school uh, closures by the end of 2020 the system had already lost uh, 159 in-person school days and the the data on the left indicate that most of the countries in Latin America remain uh, completely or partially closed for face-to-face -face education and with the remote education that's the, the remote education is uh, the most commonly used so as I mentioned at the beginning you need we need to uh, recognize the remarkable efforts uh, made by the region in terms of remote learning based on Based uh, from very low levels, there are three types of efforts uh, that I would like to highlight in this case. The efforts to implement the remote learning and solutions, combining online platform, radio, TV, printed media. So this has allowed having a more extensive uh, reach, but there are efforts to have been made to support uh, pr uh, teachers, uh, parents, and there are many efforts that have been undertaken. Despite this, however, and, we, and these, uh, despite the efforts, we know that remote education cannot replace the face-to-face -face learning. There are three topics that I would like to highlight in, in this case. The student participation and engagements are really difficult to achieve and to maintain through time. And this is, and this is true when there is no access to digital devices uh, like a uh, like uh, like uh, kids and vulnerable uh, families are experiencing the monitoring of the needs of students within the within the closed uh, uh, school uh, context, especially for those uh, uh, vulnerable students. And then and then the effectiveness of remote learning. This is also important to mention. This includes the, the lack of um, the, of digital platforms at different levels. So within this context. The report has uh, done initial simulations of cost that, that you could expect in terms of learning and other outcomes. Uh, just to give you, I want to highlight a couple of figures. If we go back to, to the lack of learning on the left graph, it shows that Latin America could be could, could be uh, ranked the second uh, largest expected absolute increase with an increase from 51 uh, percent to almost 63 percent so this is a, a significant uh, improvement so when we look at uh, the 15 year old uh, persons we look that the ratio of these students below the minimal performance level calculated using the PISA test could uh, could increase from 55 percent to 71 percent for a 10 months clo school closure which is uh, the reality in most of the countries and if the school remains closed for 13 months three out, out of four students could be facing this type of situation Felipe also mentioned that the huge economic cost that this entails something worth mentioning in this case it is not uh, just an added uh, aspect this is not something that you're adding uh, what's a, a, a concern or the major risk is that is that there's a socioeconomic gap um, which is uh, expanding I, the initial simulation that we did indicated that the socioeconomic achievement gap could be extended by 12 percent. We have also done analysis within the different countries. Uh, recently there was an analysis done together with the Ministry of Chile. We have noticed that the inequalities or inequities will be increasing in all the different countries. And with this, and to uh, conclude the part related to cost, we know that the, that the learning is just one part of the problem. We also have situations where the pandemics can can be reverting years of progress in terms of coverage and the effects of the physical mental and emotional health of the students which is quite significant with an increase of vulnerability uh, to risk uh, conducts 
countries are doing a lot of work in terms of uh, psychological support uh, to the families and kids at home. But this is not an easy task to do. We've also seen, seen a negative uh, repercu effects on, and, on education. I will refer to this later on, but the foreign report also refers to this type of detail. So what can we do within this context? The report is presenting or addressing three phases. The first one is, is the coping phase. While schools are closed, many of the Latin American countries are still going through this coping phase. The priority in this case, one of the priorities in these cases, or the most significant one, is to continue to, to retain the students and the system, but also to improve uh, uh, remote learning. I cannot stop in, in terms of how to do it. I'm, I cannot address this further, but the report includes recommendations in this regard. The second phase is to manage continuity as the schools reopen. As I mentioned before, most of the countries are, are, are going through these two phases with their schools completely or partially closed and using remote learning or a different model. This is the phase that I would like to, to address further in the following slides of my presentation, because this is the phase, this is the most important phase of the process. This is the phase where we will be recovering uh, the learning process. At the very least, um, many of the countries, given the volatility that we're going through, the countries need to move towards this phase and they need to start uh, preparing themselves for a, for a safe and secure opening of the schools. Perhaps they will not be open tomorrow, but we need to be ready for that process because the recovery will be will will take uh, longer and the third that phase is an improving uh, an improvement and acceleration phase every crisis also involves an opportunity and uh, even in this crisis there this is actually the opportunity to improve the system for in the long term I'm not going to um, talk about this further but I want to highlight a, a couple of aspects managing a continuity what do we need to do to make sure that schools can reopen securely and effectively from the different perspectives there are four areas four pillars that can be highlighted in this case and which have been supported by the world bank and other different organizations in the many countries in the region the the safe operations area for the the recovery of the learning, the inclusion of the most marginalized and the well-being and protection. So I'm going, I'm going to finish my presentation by referring to each one of these areas. So the most important thing that we need to take into consideration is that apart from an initial strategy, the positive thing is that we already have evidence, lessons, emerging lessons of what's actually working in these areas. And this is the purpose of the study. Um, it is not just to say that we have to do something now, but it, we need to share experiences and best practices in terms of what is actually working in the different countries. Safe operations. This is a fundamental topic and uh, because we're all concerned about this now the evidence has uh, indicated that with the hygiene and uh, and health uh, protocols adequate for the school context and with measures to reduce the density of population in the schools it is possible to to reopen and to reduce the contagion risks that can be done but there has there has to be a good policy in place. Uh, the facilities at schools have to be improved and these protocols have to be followed. The, the density of the population at school is extremely important and this is leading us to the, uh, to the hybrid education that I will be referring to in the following slides. Learning. How can we recover the learning when, when the schools reopen? So there are def different uh, the decisions have to be made. And I think that the panelists will perhaps go into further detail. Just uh, four things that I would like to highlight in this case. It will be important to simplify the curriculum to help uh, deal 
with uh, with this um, uh, recovery, it will be important and it is extremely, and this is something that we're noticing in several countries to adapt the academic calendar to compensate for the loss of in-person classes. There are different ways that can, that can be um, used to do this. The third point is we need to have a, a diagnostic classroom assessments to, to determine what's uh, the, the learning gap. What I highlighted before are th in terms of the simulation or the, we, most of them inv involve simulations because we do not know exactly what will be the cost of this. When reopening uh, the schools, we will notice and it. it is extremely important to do a diagnosis and to provide the, the tools to the teachers to, to assess where are the students or what's their status. And this is related to the fourth point, which has to do with the this design and implement and implementation of remedial programs to close these learning gaps. There are several lessons included in the report in terms of, of the design of this remediation. This, and this is a, an important point that I would like to highlight. This will take place during uh, the following months within a context of hybrid education. A, a context where, where, where in-person re and remote education will converge. Based on what I've mentioned, uh, for the safe reopening, the schools will not be uh, reopened, uh, will not reopen overnight we need to do this following the social distancing and this will require a, a hybrid education model and this will involve a challenge for the region to design or implement it if done adequately these may produce actually very good results i would like to um, Talking about uh, the inclusion of the most uh, marginalized i know that i'm running out of time but this is something that I noticed at the beginning. The most vulnerable will be will be strongly affected. So it will be really important to make sure that by the time the schools reopen, they have there there have to be um, resources for these type of groups to make sure that they can go back to school, to, that they remain at school, in coordination with social protection programs and the well-being and the protection. Uh, there are there are countries that are introducing within their career curriculum, they're, the reopening plan, they're providing psychosocial and mental health problem programs for the students, uh, teachers, and families, and this is extremely important. Before um, talking about the, the managing uh, continuity aspect, I would like to, I would like to, to talk about the funding, and this is extremely important. Reopening schools safely and effectively will also require the we will require public funds in term invested in education. We need to recognize that within a crisis context and within with the tax burden, the resources will be limited from the standpoint it will be extremely important to prioritize the, the education, additional uh, funds for vulnerable schools. And it has to do, uh, it has to be done as equitably and efficiently. So the report also covers some equity and funding aspects. And there's another point in terms of the uh, improv improvement and acceleration. There are many things that you could do. Uh, for example, as I mentioned before, the learning in Latin America had, had was already suffering this type of uh, process, but but something that could actually be done in the long term is to adapt some of the strategies and the way how they have been successfully implemented or uh, before or during the crisis. There are many countries who that have uh, used the early alerts uh, systems to identify and to monitor those students who are at risk of dropout. Other countries have done a lot of efforts to build a information and education system to manage their information and to make decisions. And um, 
and there are countries that uh, that uh, were establishing technology, adaptive technology programs to to remediate and accelerate learning. This could take place on a permanent basis, but uh, but as but there will but we need to address uh, uh, the problems related to to the digital barriers as the World Bank. Just to remind that we that we have tried to support the different countries in these various phases in the short term, in the midterm, and uh, trying to develop this vision um, in the long term with the different countries. These are some of the some of the key messages. The initial estimates of the school closure effects in, in are uh, staggering. All the learning metrics are worsening dramatically. And the fact, and, and the students are greatly affected. Countries should get ready for the safe and effective school reopening to start the long-term recovery. They can lever leverage on many emerging lessons. And these are good news. Public resources have to be prioritized for the education sector. But uh, the pandemic also implies a window of opportunity. So we need to benefit uh, from these opportunities. So let's act now because we could, we could, because the whole generation could be lost. So we need to keep on moving. We need to, to try, uh, we need to um, avoid these type of losses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuela. This is actually a very interesting report uh, and with the ideas. And I know that you have done a lot of efforts to summarize this in such a short uh, time frame to, to debate uh, around not only uh, about the diagnosis of the situation, but also the alternatives and responses that are required we have a panel, we have a very interesting panel, uh, honored uh, uh, guests here. We are going to hear Raul Figueroa, who's the Minister of Education of Chile, who, who has had a, an academic trajectory in the university and the civil society as the founder of, of Acción Educar, which is a study center. So then after the minister, we will hear from Priscilla Cruz. She's the president, executive CEO and founder of, um, of uh, Todos de la Cazón, which is a civil society educate, uh, um, institution in Brazil. And, this is, and she's actually clearly one of the most important voices in, in, in the civil society, not only in Brazil, but also in Latin America. Then we will here from Sandra Garcia. Sandra Garcia, she's a teacher from the from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, and she and we are very pleased to to. She's a non-resident fellow of the of the interim of the El Dialogo Interamericano. And then we will close the panel with Jaime Savera, who's the global director of the World Bank. He was uh, formerly the Minister of Education in Peru. So I'll pass the floor to Minister Figueroa. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you, Emanuela, for, for such an interesting presentation of uh, the report, which is, which is actually a very relevant input to be able to support the work that we're currently carrying out in the different countries and in Chile in order to face the best way possible the complex consequences of the COVID. The negative effects of this pandemic in the education sector are evident. And, and the report that was presented clearly shows what's the impact and how that impact is relatively similar and in all the different places globally, certainly in our case, in the case of Chile, there's no, ex this is no exception. We actually work with the World Bank to establish the right tools to generate the diagnosis that confirms how the pandemic is affecting the learning 
and and affect uh, the learning process of students how this increases the the learning gaps in, which are quite uh, significant in Latin America and how this is exacerbating the, situ the situation and, and affecting uh, the emotional wellness of students. So at this time, I would, I would like to do an analysis. Uh, uh, I think that Emanuela's presentation was uh, very interesting and I would like uh, to, to use the time I have to, to convey what has been the experience in our country around the pandemic and how are we facing or coping the challenges, the immediate challenges and the challenges that we will see in the mid and long term. The first thing to mention, and this is, this is a, perhaps a, a contest the approach, uh, is that the first effort in terms of the pandemic has to do with the sanitary measures and the suspension of classes whose uh, negative effects have been quite evident that that was considered at that time a, a mechanism needed to face the pandemic. And, uh, and the, the class suspension gives rise to an impact and the main effort of the Chilean government was to react faster to mitigate the negative effects of the of the extended class suspension using uh, 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 free access offering free access such as uh, TV uh, putting those uh, means available to those who need it the most perhaps uh, uh, 1 million 800 kids are are fed in the in the schools in 72 hours we changed the, the system to get this food to their home so this is we're talking about uh, 27 um, units of food that have been delivered to the different to mitigate the, the suspension um, class suspension effects but as indicated by Emanuela and the presidency, nothing re replaces the face-to-face -face education. We need to strengthen the efforts to mitigate the effects of the class, uh, of the, of the in-person education. And we do know that, that, that these are not uh, sufficient uh, in terms of efforts to be able to compensate the negative effects that this pandemic has had. So in this regard, just as we have made efforts to mitigate, we the main focus and is to strengthen these um, instruments, but to recover to a greater extent as the conditions allow the spaces for for uh, for face to face training at school. So this is something that we have been done uh, since the last the first schools uh, opened in in July of 2020, and we. And we had 15% of our schools operating at the end of the year. And this year, we started the process. So what, what I want to explain how this process has taken place and how is it that we're developing a plan to recover the learning and to manage the social emotional um, um, condition of our students and, and to avoid dropout. Being this a sanitary mission, the reopening has to be consistent with this process. So the first objective is how is to, to recover the trust of the different education communities to, to uh, explain that it is safe to go back to school. Despite the fact that, that, that in the in the world it was it was indicated that schools were not the best environment to to be at, we know that this is possible to combine the factors of sanitary measure, measures with with uh, with um, your with the face to face training. So protocols were implemented with the Ministry of Health in Chile, and we generated. We established a council with involvement of, of uh, international agencies, UNESCO, UNICEF, and national entities, experts in the epidemiology sector, experts from the academia who, who um, uh, we have also teachers uh, involved in this council so that we can generate a common um, space of trust. The, the, the sanitary protocols, this council which has supported and um, 
the coordination of this uh, reopening process with the general plan of reopening at the national level in other activities, which is called Paso a Paso in Chile. So we are creating spaces for opening. So this has allowed moving forward in the process. So we need to generate trust among the different communities. And for that purpose, we, we took advantage of the summer period. There are vacations uh, in January and February so that during that period, 100% of the, of the educational um, education as, or the schools were uh, prepared based on their own realities. We know that there's a lot of diversity in the different establishments in order to combine the face-to-face -face training and the remote education um, as much as possible. So within that context and with the support that we obtained uh, in 2020, we in we we began on March uh, with uh, with uh, uh, in-person training, except for those uh, places where where uh, where quarantine has been decreed. So these, uh, in, so 55% of the establishments in Chile had their 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 in-person training and the different communities had to adapt themselves to the process together with the different protocols of the different organizations we established we established uh, a protocols in the event that COVID cases are identified this is fundamental because we need to avoid an outbreak and we need to convey uh, the message that this is something that is uh, possible so the interesting thing is that the epidemiology study that we did with the ministry with the Ministry of Health in 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 Chile, we have a very good organization of data to to for the public policy. We this allowed to identify that ninety eight percent of the of the schools that were open in March had no COVID outbreaks, and only two point twenty five percent had an outbreak with two or more cases that are uh, connected. And those outbreaks allowed uh, taking additional preventive measures. So this allowed confirming that opening schools is possible, is safe, and that the communities are gradually understanding how this can take place to the point that nowadays uh, with the second outbreak that we're experiencing a, a good part of the schools are um, in quarantine and this is a situation that we experienced in 2020. We have different groups that are requesting the opening of schools. And this shows that the experience that was offered was extremely positive. Together with these, from the, from the health standpoint, as the uh, Chile gave priority to the vaccination um, uh, of all education, all the different, uh, all the different uh, persons working at schools are went through uh, their vaccination process. Those who didn't get the shot is because they didn't want to do it. We have ninety percent of the of the teachers vaccinated in Chile, and ninety five percent of them have already went through their second shot. So these. Uh, conveys more uh, safety uh, in terms of the reopenings. And then lastly, I understand that, the, that the, we can address this further in the, in the Q&A session. The fundamental thing is not to open, not, ju not just to open um, the schools, but also to address the negative consequences. So for that purpose, Chile has established a plan uh, that is called Chile Recovers and Learns. So uh, this involves the leveling, it, it involves the social emotional wellness of the students and the reinsertion of those who may have dropped out uh, of the system. So this is, uh, this involves a series of elements, many of which have shown to be or have proven to be effective, like the, such as the early alert system. And this, this allowed us to recover uh, six of uh, out of every 10 uh, students who had lost contact with the schools. So this indicates that the dropout uh, rates could be are controlled and, and we achieved uh, um, the same figures as, as those experienced in a regular genes. There is a comprehensive learning diagnosis that will allow 
all the different schools to diagnose the wellness for the, the social emotional condition of the students and their learning uh, le level, you know, the different levels at the school uh, setting. So this diagnosis was prepared by the Ministry of Education with, with the different agencies. So it's available to, uh, to all the different schools and it's done at a, at a student level, it is corrected. And then and each school re receives a report uh, with the, establishing the social, emotional, and learning uh, parameters of students. So, so this allows um, addressing the social, emotional difficulties of our students who have been strongly affected by the process, not just the students, but the teachers who are essential to the process. And, and this allows retaining and reincorporating our students to the educational system. So this has had a positive impact. We have, unfortunately, it would be interesting uh, to look at the different experiences. We have, saw, we have seen certain reluctance. I think that the main obstacle for the reopening of schools is not uh, related to the health or uh, but uh, but it's mostly related to the political conflicts. So we're doing as much as we can to depolitize this process. Uh, we're going to have elections, uh, and this contributes, uh, and and this is something that has to be well managed. Uh, so to summarize, and and this is the end of my intervention. The effort the efforts are being made to to make sure that the students go back to school to work on the basis of evidence and uh, to convey confidence to the different uh, families so that we so that they can gradually and safely yeah, flexibility is also important to recover the different uh, spaces at school and um, by implementing a plan to recover the learning to level to recover the social emotional um, setting of the students and to reinsert those who had abandoned the, the education system and this is a, a process that is underway and it has shown important positive effects so this is what i had to share with you so we may uh, delve into into uh, specific aspects thank you very much I know that there, there are several questions in the chat. I would like to invite uh, Priscilla. I want to thank for the invitation to be here in this panel, this very, very panel to discuss this crucial report, this World Bank report that is helping a lot the discussion here in Brazil. I want to thank Michael Schifter, Adiel uh, Fishbein, a, a friend, a colleague that is walking uh, with us for many, many years. And uh, also uh, Jaime Saavedra, also this very, uh, this important partner of Todos Pela Educação. So I, I wanna thank for the opp opportunity to be here. I couldn't agree more with uh, Manuela explanation and uh, exposition. Minister Salas also, I've learned a lot. I couldn't agree more. Uh, what I, what I want to do is to add maybe some other points or maybe other views to the same problem. Of course, you all know here in Brazil, the pandemic is hitting very hard education systems. Uh, we are having nearly 4,000 deaths every day. So the pandemic is in a very, very high level. We had some tentative uh, reopenings of schools here, but all schools now are closed again. So it's been very, very hard. The, the bond between students and schools are getting weaker and weaker every week. The schools are closed. So of course, we are like facing the same thing and we, we, um, we can agree with the, re with the, the report. Uh, the impacts are being brutal on uh, uh, learning, the, the mental health of students, the cognitive uh, development of all the students, physical development, social emotional development, uh, nutrition, uh, uh, physical um, uh, safety. So we are really, really in a very, very uh, difficult situation here in Brazil with thousands and thousands of orphans 
uh, young kids, teenagers, and young people being orphans because their uh, parents are dying with the, the, the COVID uh, disease. Of course, this is, we will face lifelong consequences. We have a lot of work to do here. And as a civil society organization, we work with governments. We help uh, municipalities and state governments uh, to uh, face all these uh, huge uh, uh, problem and challenge that we have with the COVID and uh, the school closures. So I want to talk more about the, the response that we are working here in Brazil. We are mainly helping municipalities and state governments in like viewing three main highways. It's like we have three main highways to go through. Of course, these highways have lots of uh, uh, streets connecting them, but we have three main highways that we have to go through these three main highways. There is no other way we have to uh, walk, drive on these highways. The first one, and this is one of the things that I like, for me, it's the main legacy of this uh, pandemic on education. We talk a lot of about uh, technology and hybrid and online remote learning. But in Brazil, what like the main uh, thing that explains the success cases that we have, we don't have a lot, but we have a lot of, but, they, but we have some of uh, successful cases in Brazil. What explain the success uh, cases is governance. I'm not talking about management, I'm talking about governance. So local governance, uh, putting together education, health, uh, social, social uh, uh, area, uh, culture, sports, uh, the financing uh, secretary, and also the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary areas all together to work together. There is no way education can get away of this and face this challenge without everybody working together. So we have the local governance uh, working like much better in some cases here in Brazil. And it is not a coincidence that these are the, the places that the, the COVID, the pandemic is hitting less harder than other uh, uh, regions and, and uh, municipalities. So we are learning and working a lot with governance. That's why we are, one of the things that we are working with the, the National Congress is the national education system. We have in Brazil, like a, a national health system, SUS. And because of this, the pandemic is not skyrocketing even more. We need a national uh, education system in Brazil to to get the, uh, the, the responsibilities and accountability more clear, clearer for everyone with all the duties, everything that needs to be done for each one of the actors. We need to organize all this. And this is one of the laws we are helping the National Congress to pass this year. The same way we have the, the Congress, the National Congress to pass and approve the new Fundeb, Fundeb is the financing system that redistributes uh, the, the money that is invested per student here in the country so that we don't have a huge difference in investment per student. The same way we have to approve, now we are working with the national education system, this national governance. We are working with the bilateral so and, and also local governance, the national governance. And there is one thing that I've been like advocating since the, the, the beginning of the pandemic in education. We need an international governance. The same way that after the World War II, uh, we had like a, an increase and an improvement of this international 
organisms and and uh, and uh, governance. We need an international governance to help organize the response of all of the countries. And the same thing here in Latin America. We need a Latin American governance to help governance uh, governments uh, to face and uh, uh, and have more results in this challenge to improve education. So I have no doubts and we can go and we can talk further about this topic. And I go back uh, in, a, in a minute. The other highway is of course, and I'm, I'm not gonna talk uh, a lot about this, is the emergency uh, measures, uh, policies. So Emanuela talked about many of them. The report is brilliant on showcasing all these um, uh, uh, short-term measures that we need in order to reopen schools with safety and also with all the pedagogical and educational uh, measures to improve education, to mitigate uh, the, 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 the kids that are, that are living behind in terms of learning, in terms of all developments like cognitive, social, social emotional, and etc. So we have to, of course, uh, have a special look to this uh, short-term uh, policies like uh, uh, learning assessment, uh, teachers training, and more than teachers training, uh, teachers development, uh, professional development. So we have a huge arch of policies uh, uh, to improve teachers' uh, practice. And uh, of course, Communication with with families and students, engagement. So I'm not I'm not gonna repeat because I think Emanuela was very very good on uh, presenting all this uh, short term uh, measures, and we have to do this. So this is a highway that it's a, a speed highway. So we have to move fast because this generation depends on us, depends on this response, very fast and very effective uh, response. And the third highway is the more like structural public policies. We cannot forget about the, the structured uh, public policies that we need to build in our countries, in our region. We haven't finished this, this lesson uh, yet. So I want to highlight some of these uh, public policies that we need now. Even more, we need to invest more, more money, more energy, more management in order to close the gaps and also go like further with uh, the, uh, the learning that was lost, but also to put the region in another level. The level that we were before the pandemic is not the level that we want to go back to. We want to surpass that level. We want even more. And I think we were all working for this. So this is the, the goal is not to go back to where we were. We have to like go uh, and uh, ambition, ambitious, uh, to be ambitious uh, of much more uh, about our education. So the first public policy that I want to highlight is early child development. We were talking about uh, the, the inequality that is increasing with, this, with the school closures and with this horrible situation that we are in now. Uh, I was talking about the orphans and I was, I'm, I go, I go to bed and I wake up every day thinking about these orphans and all the children that are not going to schools, are not developing uh, their, their skills. So early child development is key. And I don't think that our region uh, is uh, success, successful on carry on these policies in, in, in Brazil and other countries. I've been in many, many of the countries in the region. So we need to face early childhood development policies. The other one is teachers' uh, professional development. Uh, 
we need to attract better students to the profession, the initial training, the, the, the pedagogical training, the, 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 the superior um, uh, in, the, in the universities uh, training, or in the job training, so careers, we have a lot to do. And for me, more than technology, we need to focus on teachers. Technology, of course, we can leverage all this, can help teachers and should help teachers, but the focus has to be on teachers, of course. The third thing and last thing I want to emphasize is the modernization of high school. The dropout rates are like much more uh, uh, increased on uh, youth. So we are losing students in the high school level. So we need to modernize school, the school, uh, the, the, the high school uh, level. Of course, we have a lot of problems right now, but there is one aspect that I want to emphasize in this uh, topic is vocational training. We Bueno, me parece que perdimos la conexión. I'm sorry. I was saying, so the professional, the, the, the vocational training is key now. We have three main areas that we should work very, very hard. Vocational training for the green economy, vocational training for the digital, digital uh, economy, and like in the case in, in Brazil, but also is, I think is the case in, for, the, for the region, is the vocational training for the creative uh, economy. We need, the, we need this young people back to school and vocational training is the strategy to, to, to grab the students and put them uh, back uh, to, to schools and also help the economy in our region. So I wanna, closer and finish my, my talk here to say that I don't think that we have a technical problem. Uh, I think the World Bank, other organizations, Todos Pela Educação, we are always thinking of solutions and technical solutions for education. I think that the main problem, and I loved to, to hear uh, Minister Salas talk, uh, our main problem is political. We need to convince governments. Uh, we need to convince presidents. We need to convince mayors. We need to convince society that we will rebuild our countries with investment and good investment on education, with education. This is our main problem. So, and with this, I go back to my first point, international governance. I fully, I, I, I'm convinced that we need to build an international governance, putting together all this effort to think together and also to build uh, an environment of commitment uh, with education, with the education of the poorest kids. So, I'm open and happy to answer the questions and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, uh, Priscilla. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Sandra? Thank you, Ariel, and thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, to the World Care for giving me this uh, opportunity, Emanuela, for such an awesome presentation. And I really enjoyed reading the, the whole report and it, it, this is a roadmap for the region. I'm going to focus my comments on the last part, uh, which has to do with the recommendations. The study suggests these three phases, which are extremely important. 
And the first one is to face, to cope the pandemic while schools are closed. And I would like to stop there a little bit with a question that uh, maybe uh, Jaime can answer in a few minutes. And it's, on, uh, while, on, when are we, stop, are we going to stop saying while schools are closed? And I think that this is, this is a wake up call. Um, that is uh, giving us, uh, given by the report, uh, given the extended closing or closure of schools. I'm not going to talk about the figures. Emmanuel already spoke about this, but I think that the reopening of schools in the region has been uh, slower compared to other areas in the region, partly because the pandemic has affected us significantly, and also partly because we have been slower in terms of preparing ourselves and supporting the different schools. Uh, uh, with this emergency. As indicated by the study, the remote learning cannot be cannot cannot be replaced by by face to face, especially in, in aspects that have to do with the motivation of students connecting to students and to making sure that they stay at school. The report that's on point in, in time indicated and I fully agree that this is a true tragic tragedy. And uh, and with this tragedy that we're experiencing I would like to, to uh, raise the bar in terms of the urgency to recover um, these times uh, to go back to school. And now, and Minister Figueroa has uh, shared interesting experiences in Chile where where we have, um, we may raise a question and how is it that we can support the different countries to accelerate the preparation of schools? the report that recognizes that there are places where where it is very difficult due to the epidemiology, perhaps as Priscilla indicated in the case of Brazil and other countries in the region where the cases are are extremely high. It is very difficult to, to think uh, about reopening schools if we have quarantines or mandatory quarantines in all the different economy sectors. But there are other cases where, where this could be done, where the cases are, are decreasing and, and, and as the conditions so allow, and as the report indicated, there are other cases where the schools have not managed to prepare themselves after, after the 12 or the 13 months of closure. And, and this is where I, I would like to share a couple of thoughts. The first one is I perceive that there's a, a region need to establish clear guidelines uh, from the in terms of how, when to open and, or when to close the schools. So this is why the alliances and the governance that uh, Priscilla mentioned and uh, what the minister has mentioned as well in terms of articulating the, the education and the health sector is extremely important to establish cri the right criteria. And what will be the basic conditions to be able to safely open schools? Literature has indicated that, that this can be done with basic conditions conditions in order to open the schools. So there's a message that it is, it is not the fact that the whole country or all the different countries will open or close. And the second, within our countries, we, we have noticed a lot of differences in terms of how the pandemic is being addressed. So the epidemiology uh, criteria and the different decisions at the school level may vary uh, depending uh, on the site. And there's an important point and when we talk about the rural areas, the remote areas, the students have been affected in the remote areas because as, as indicated, but they don't have uh, opportunities. They cannot have connectivity. They cannot have the devices to connect and 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 they, they do not have a support because perhaps the parents do not have uh, sufficient uh, education. So some of the experiences in, in the region is when talking about uh, Uruguay, when they decided to reopen, I know that this is, they're going through a very difficult uh, time in Uruguay. When they decided to open, they established priorities uh, and they prioritized the rural areas at w where they need uh, this type of education, given the difficulties that I just mentioned. So as uh, indicated by the minister uh, or as shown uh, in different countries, it is important to make decisions how to condition the schools based on the context. What, what does a safe school mean in a rural area that is only covering 10 students? So I think that these, uh, these uh, 
this can actually take place uh, easier compared to an urban school that is um, uh, covering a high number of students. So, so, uh, we need, so it is important to provide school uh, support to these schools based on the content. The second point uh, in this regard has, is, has to do with the political aspect and the reluctance by the different sectors. We are afraid uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's reluctance uh, by the parents or even by different uh, groups of teachers. And I think that, that the lesson that we have seen in several countries has been the importance of uh, providing adequate communication, adequate guidelines and to build a trust in order to safely open schools. So I think that that bottleneck was also important and it has to be well addressed. And then finally, in this uh, emergency of the reopening, the prioritization of the vaccination of, of teachers, I think that that could be a very interesting message. And this is something that I will mention at the end of my comments. And I think that these, these uh, can actually help us overcome this bottleneck bottleneck to to accelerate the reopening. Uh, another comment that I wanted to give you in terms of the report, there is a very important message in the report and is how can we benefit from this crisis to improve and to expedite the, the progress and the quality of our education system and there and the report has indicated uh, it suggests to to strengthen and to benefit from the innovation and three in the information um, in the information system, the diagnosis of the learning among the different students and and the, and the teaching at the right level where technology can be used to expedite learning. So I want, I, I urge you to read the different experiences uh, included in the report. And I also want to highlight that the importance or the opportunity to have uh, economies of scale or to share experiences within the region, to share technologies, contents, methodologies, where the experience of the World Bank is so important to be able to, to streamline this learning in the region. And I wanna finish my comments by by mentioning something that applies to everyone in and it and it and it uh, covers the short term but also the opportunity and the future uh, as indicated by the report that, and and that, and this is a, a fundamental aspect and it has to do with the teachers the report has indicated that in the short term uh, teachers uh, require more support to implement this edu this hybrid education systems uh, when we need to have a less uh, amount of students, but also to implement all the different support programs to recover the learning and the tutoring and the different strategies needed. And I was really concerned about the figure that I saw, which indicated that more than 70% have not, are not, more than 70% are not planning to, to engage more teachers. And this, this in, involves a very important bottleneck that has to be uh, addressed adequately. The report has uh, indicated some uh, strategies to support uh, um, uh, these, uh, to support the, the, the burden that they have to go through the implementation of strategies for the support in the, from the, in the pedagogical or uh, technological aspects. And I think it is important to mention the implementation of those strategies uh, as indicated by the report which are important actions in the short term. Now, in the long term, uh, when, uh, after, if we look at this as an opportunity to establish reforms to improve the education systems in the long term, I would, I would actually mention something that, that uh, we had uh, in this crisis that summarizes the report and, and, it's, and, it, it, and it's documented with the simulation, but there was a crisis that we were experiencing before the pandemic. And we had a crisis in terms of the low capacity of the different um, uh, countries to attract and to retain professionals or talented professionals or teachers and to establish a firm policies for the professional development of uh, teachers. 
So I think that this could also be an opportunity first uh, to effectively um, support the, the teachers or professors to to regain their learning. And this is an opportunity to to establish uh, a, a the profession in the region. So we have different incentives, uh, we, but also the education and service and the initial um, the initial education, perhaps to to delve into this topic, I and and report also indicates the importance to protect the education budgets, and I think that this is fundamental as well. I will also support uh, include a message of uh, having education as a national priority uh, at a country level. Uh, with respect to the as to the political cost of the polarization that we're experiencing in terms of opening or non opening and um, and a message that I'm I compiled from some European countries where where uh, they uh, where schools are the last to close and the and the first to open we have many many sectors in the economy the different uh, areas it's not that just to provide that support in terms of budget, but also political support to the education to recover education as part of the of the process. Thank you, Sandra. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I was having uh, trouble here with the camera. Thank you very much for the invitation, Ariel, and for the presentation of uh, Manuela. I fully agree with many of the points that have been mentioned by uh, by by Sandra, Felipe, and Priscilla, and um, and uh, Minister Figueroa. But I would like to start by, by raising a couple of points mentioned by Sandra, which is, has to do with the continuity of what she was mentioning. And it's uh, the sense of urgency. We have uh, indicated several times that these uh, led to the worst crisis in education and in the last century. But we need to to convey the, import the importance or the relevance of this message. What's the impact? The impact on, on our youth is uh, 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 immense. And I think that there's a relation and in the sanitary crisis, which is uh, affecting us significantly in the short term. And I think that we're not looking at the extent of the educational crisis because this has a less visible impact in the short term. And there will be a huge impact uh, in the wellness and productivity, uh, future productivity of, uh, of the kids that should be attending school nowadays. So we're talking about the, we're talking about the Latin America, uh, a lost year. So in this regard, I know that we're running out of time. Uh, I have four points uh, to share. Going back to the last point of Sandra, um, which has to do with, uh, with the tax uh, funds uh, that have to be invested in education. I think that, um, in, in a tax context that is extremely complex, we need to recognize that there's, that in many countries, uh, to additional tutoring is required, additional teachers are required in many countries. We need, we normally say that we need to close the digital gap, that we need to have all the safety protocols in place, that we need to make sure that the kids or children have the technology uh, and the adequate technology. It is impossible that uh, to think that this could be done without any funds. So we need to maintain, we need to protect, we need to expand the, the education uh, resources. Unfortunately, based on the information that we have had globally, what we've seen is that uh, in low and low and medium income, two thirds of the countries are reporting are, are cutting off their education budgets, and one third of them are increasing. In the wealthiest country, we see, we see the contrary. Two thirds of those countries are increasing their education budgets. Some of the largest countries uh, will look the, at the at the programs, the financial support programs, the the financial aid uh, in Germany and England and the US and they and they have a clear education components and this is not something that we're seeing in many of our uh, 
poorest uh, economies uh, or middle income economies. So, so this is an important battle that we need to fight. We need to give priority to the effectiveness of the expenditure, but the emphasis that we need to give in this case, in terms of the budget is crucial, taking into account that those losses has a future income for this generation, which were uh, mentioned by Felipe Jaramillo. He was talking about 1.7 billion. That's a huge figure. And that loss uh, corresponds to this generation. This generation will have to pay the debt, uh, uh, the debt incurred in, in by the different uh, countries in order to face the situation. So there is a war. Uh, countries need, if there's a war, countries need to get to uh, get an indebtedness to face the situation. The second point that I want to highlight is that we need to be to emphasize on the measurement. Um, of the of the learning gap, not not only at the school level, we need to provide teachers with the tools so that they can know exactly how kids are doing after one year lost. Where what's the status of each one of the students? So these are the tools that the, the teachers need to have. And then on the other hand, we need to we need to go back to the national and regional evaluations or assessments to determine how uh, is her status as a country. We know that we have we had a, we have a lot of simulation, but we need to be clear about the 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 lag knowing uh, that there is that the, the impact on inequality inequality has been significant we have some information in in the wealthiest countries but we don't have sufficient information in, in the different uh, low income countries or middle middle income uh, countries the third point is that we know we we are discussing the different situation at the different schools, as uh, mentioned uh, by Emanuela. We're going through a learning crisis. If we had had this discussion at the beginning of uh, 2020, we would have said that Latin America is, is going through a, a learning crisis. More than if more than half of the kids cannot learn or cannot read a text at the end of the year, then that involves a crisis. After the pandemics, this crisis became worst. If we didn't have the pandemic, we would be saying that we need to establish an intervention package to accelerate the different type of learning intervention at the teacher level, pedagogical support, Support, a more structured pedagogical support. We need to make sure that there are books in place for the different kids. Emphasize on on learning using technology. This is this is something that we 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 should have uh, taken into account. Right now, we're putting out fires, and it's not a matter of uh, expediting what we had to do in the past. We also need to put out this fire, and this is. And, and then we need to determine what is it to do that we need to do with the opening or what to do if schools remain closed. So we need to reflect on what Sandra mentioned. Why, why uh, do we see some restaurants and, bar, and bars opening in certain countries before schools do? So those uh, schools that decided to open their schools, they, they, it showed that the, the opening of schools had no, imp that this had no impact on the, on the contagion rates. So we need to use the evidence in this case uh, in order to decide where, when is it that schools can open. Unfortunately, at this time, we're, we're uh, going through a peak in, in some Latin American countries. And in, in many of those countries, uh, schools cannot open at this time. But we need to, but in many countries, uh, um, like Uruguay, they open the rural schools and, and uh, having all the different protocols to open as soon as possible. But this is a, this involves a, a sense of urgency that, that is not observed in the different countries. I remember um, that in June uh, or May last year, I was I spoke with, with some of the officials of the Ministry of uh, Education in, in Denmark. And and they they affirmed that they needed to address this the situation. 
So we need to determine uh, the time. So we need to think about this way. We need to open when when something can be open. And then secondly, we need to be prepared to, to make sure that this happens as soon as possible. So once we open partially, we need to think of the different type of interventions that, uh, that are needed in terms of hybrid education, the tutoring, we need to prioritize the vaccination of, uh, of teachers. We need to simplify curriculum. We need to identify those uh, students who may be uh, dropping out uh, to make sure that they go back to school. We need to continue with the with the education TV. We need to make sure that the technology is available and that the, and that and that kids. This may take longer, but we need to uh, close this digital gap. And and the, this is some this is some uh, concepts that I wanted to share. We do I think that we do have an opportunity to go back to a system that is different to what we had before, and has to be more resilient and more efficient. And these can be done if we learn a little bit more of the lessons learned from the pandemic. One one first lesson is, is, is to close the digital gap and it has to be done fast. Secondly, and going back to a point that mentioned by Priscilla, it, although technology is important, I know that we need to recognize the, the important role of teachers in the education process. And, the, and, and this is a human interaction process, a good, a, a good the education requires a good teacher. So making sure that they become professional, insisting that that, that this has to be a, that, that we have the best teachers ever. Not only the preparation uh, in service and, and all, I think that it is extreme, extremely important to, to, um, to make sure that they become professional. And then thirdly, and education needs to be resilient and by saying this there has to be continuity of the educational process between the school and the home and this is how we need to work to reduce the inequalities in terms of uh, uh, among the different schools in our countries we need to make sure that we work to reduce those inequalities at the household level we need to we, we need to be concerned as part of the public policy to support them, to make sure that they they um, become uh, the main um, promoters of the education. We need to make sure that the different houses have a digital device. It is not just a, a matter of having a device and it, it requires uh, the teach, it, it requires uh, uh, the software and, and so on. So we need to make sure that the that technologies, the books and the support to the parents should become part of the po educational policy, not only to reduce the inequalities that we've seen at school, but also the inequalities uh, to make sure that, that there is continuity of the educational process at home. So this is what makes this uh, more resilient. So this is a major opportunity, but I want to close uh, with, uh, when, this is a sense of urgency, as Sandra mentioned, we need to move on, on uh, faster with this sense of urgency to um, be able to resolve this crisis as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jaime, and thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thank, uh, thanks to our panelists. We ran out of time. We, we are, we are at the end of the time, and, and we have a whole amount of questions. The, the team has been responding to some of the questions, but we're not going to. So we still, this is a challenge for a following meeting, but I would like to take a couple of minutes, additional minutes to, to give you a summary, but I think, but I want, but there are some important messages in terms of the panelists and some of the questions asked by the participants. There is consensus in terms of the urgency and the drama that we're going through. These will have a very harmful effects in the long term. And, and this is 
this is a wake up call for everyone, the, the different governments, citizens, cooperation uh, uh, agencies, the academy to be able to operate in terms of what the, of the educational crisis that we're facing. The response, although um, a lot of the energy is focused on, on the reopening and the conditions for the reopening of schools, the, the response process and the readaptation yeah, will will that that's an effort that will last a long time. This crisis will be with us for such for a quite a few years. If we do things right, then this will last forever. So this requires, in my opinion, and this is something that has been suggested by the different panelists, and they are actually included in many of the questions asked by the audience. This involves a comprehensive plan. It is clear uh, that there's a huge challenge uh, in terms of funding, not only for the reopening, but also for the investments uh, that were needed before the pandemic, but uh, which have become essential. Uh, We've uh, mentioned the connectivity um, aspect, uh, also the public and private alliances. This is not something, this, this will not only involve a public investment, but also a private investment. Um, we also made, mention was also made about the, the teachers, the, the, the training, providing support to them. So these are the challenges that we had before and they're actually more urgent at this time. We should not forget the pedagogical aspects. Several questions were and comments were made by the audience about the need to adapt the curriculum to establish targets to prioritize the different types of uh, uh, learning uh, strategies for the recovery. And for that purpose, it is essential. And uh, as uh, Jaime mentioned that there were a couple of questions, it is important to have information. It is important how the statistics are. So this requires evaluation, not to punish uh, a person or to do different reports, but all, but to know exactly how kids are doing um, and to be able to implement effective strategies aimed at covering the gaps that students have. And the general concern for uh, the fact that many students will not go back to school, um, these will require additional effort efforts, which also involve a cost. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we didn't have sufficient time to, to address question by question, but this is something that happens very commonly because we're talking uh, uh, about the very interesting uh, topics. So I want to express my gratitude. I want to um, express, I want to congratulate the World Bank team for the awesome study that they prepared. I want to express my gratitude to the different panelists for such a bright and, and, and interesting ideas and to the audience for the energy that you have shown uh, through the questions and comments that you have uh, uh, that you have included and to continue with this dialogue in the future without any further ado. Thank you very much and, and see you in, in, in a future meeting.